Hello, I'm Jimmy Wright, president of the Pastel Society of America. Welcome to the 48th annual Pastel Exhibition, Enduring Brilliance. Each year since 1972, the Society has hosted a demonstration by one of its leading artists. Usually the demonstration takes place in the Grand Gallery of the National Arts Club, and the artist works from an easel surrounded by the exhibition. This year, because of the pandemic, our exhibition is online. You can find it at pastelsocietyofamerica.org. Today, we're going upstate New York to the studio of signature artist Corey Pitkin. Corey is a member of what I characterize as a new generation of pastel artists. He's predominantly self-taught, and his work transcends the practice of observational painting from life. His beautiful portraits and figure works are an exploration of ephemeral beauty expressed simply and genuinely. He uses muted colors complemented with subtle edge work bringing out all the characteristics of what makes soft pastel so exceptional and beautiful. Joining him today in the studio is David Francis, a PSA master pastelist. David is going to moderate and answer any questions you have by text. So let's go now to Corey Pitkin in his upstate New York studio. Corey? Hi, everybody. I'm Corey Pitkin, and we're broadcasting live from the Sandy Hill Art Center in Hudson Falls, New York. Uh, joining me today is my uh, good friend and studio mate, David Francis, and Matt Kessner. And our model today will be Vanessa. So, without further ado, Uh, Dave will be here uh, to read anything you've put in the chat window. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to type them out. Dave will read them to me, and I will answer them to the best of my knowledge. Or ability. One of those words. <laughs> so I'm working on UART 400 Dark today. And to start, I'm just uh, going to be taking a pastel pencil, figure out the general placement. Uh, pencil I'm using is a little bit lighter than what I would normally go for, but this is going to show up better on camera. So right now I'm just figuring where I want everything to go. center line of the face. Making sure I get the angle of this horizontal line. I'm going to take this lower measurement, divide that in half, be roughly where the nose is. Take this lower section, divide in half, be roughly where the mouth is. From there I'm squinting down so I really just see two values and start mapping out some of the features. I don't want anything detailed at this point. Just kind of scribbling it out so I have something to compare to. I think you mentioned earlier, Corey, that you're working on UART. Yep, this is uh, UART Dark 400. Yeah. 
Um, I prefer the 400. It uh, has a bit more texture. I know a lot of portrait artists tend to go for the, the higher grits, but um, you know, I want something that's going to maintain the marks. Just ask Corey if it would be possible to zoom in closer on the model. Um, you can try sure moving can the that. camera a little bit closer. <laughs> yeah, that might be as close as we're going to get with it. It's a good for you still. Yeah, yeah, it's not in my way. So. some of these stray lines, finding the, the contours that I want here. We have a question from Chris. He wants to know if you usually work on darker papers. Increasingly. Um, you know, it, it all happened by accident. I could have sworn I had the regular tan UART in my hand when I went up to the counter. But by the time I got it home, it turned out being to be UART dark. <laughs> And, uh, well, I wasn't going to let it go to waste, so I tried it out and found I absolutely love it. Uh, other papers that I often use are uh, Sennelier Le Carte. And occasionally uh, Canson Touch. Especially for the, the way I like to create a portrait. Um, I like a darker surface. Um, I find if I go with a light surface, I'm spending a lot of time just filling up the tooth so I can key the entire piece. If I start out on a dark paper, a lot of that work's already done for me. in Corey from um, England, um, Michelle Ashby's here on hey, the West Coast. Excellent. Try to stay up with the messages as they come in, but I get kind of mesmerized watching Corey draw. So. <laughs> you think you would have seen it enough by this point? <laughs> no, not enough. Where I want them now. 
I'll start mapping out my shadow shapes. And trying to keep this shadow as one solid shape as much as I can. And provide some unity to the piece and some strength to the forms. I see a question from Moises Menendez who wants to know what pencils you were using. That's a good question. <laughs> this is uh, Giaconda. Yeah. It's uh, kind of a yellow ochre. Um, typically, I'd probably work in more of a dark brown, but um, you wouldn't be able to see it. taking my time on this phase. I find the longer I stay here, the easier the color phase goes. You know, I don't have to backtrack, I don't have to repaint anything. And if I can keep my tooth open for as long as I can, I'll have better marks, It'll be a more, more pleasing piece, in my opinion at least. time making sure everything's where I want it to be. some sense of where the shoulders lie. I don't want to get into a lot of detail there because it, you know, I want the viewer to remain here in the face. Just keeping my fingers crossed, Corey, we are right across the street from the police department. So. <laughs> Let's hope that doesn't become an issue. And the firehouse. Yeah. All right, so I'll uh, move this camera, show you a bit of my palette here. Now, as you can see, the colors are organized based on the colors of the visible spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and I have uh, some warm neutrals, some cool neutrals, and then just two uh, miscellaneous sections that were open. So I threw in some colors that I felt would be useful. Uh, for the paintings I do, Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The paintings I do, you can see uh, this palette leans heavy on the darks. Uh, there's a lot of 
Unison's, uh, a good amount of Terry Ludwig's, and a good amount of Sennelier's. Um, you know, I, I've tried most brands, and those are the ones that tend to have their uh, richest and deepest darks. So to start, I'm going to go with a, a darker orange. Something in the browns. I'm really just going to block in these shadows as one single tone. without much attention to detail yet. I'm going to go slightly darker on the braids. So get something in on those. here in the hair. I find when painting blondes, green does a much better job of conveying the idea of blonde hair than yellow does. Hmm. Yellow always looks a bit garish and a little unnatural. All right, so I'm going to start moving into the lights now. Um, first thing I want to do is consider where the flesh is different colors as I'm moving across the face, because on no one is it absolutely uniform. Typically, there's a band of warmth across the center that encompasses the cheeks and the nose. The forehead, because it's right up against the bone, is a little yellower. And as we get down into the jaw area, as those planes start to turn away from us, it tends to go a little bit cooler. We have a question from Terrilyn DeBriel. Uh, she says, smartphone up, camera on the painting. What are your other two cameras? And what program are you using for the uh, split screen? The other two cameras are an iPad right here and this uh, little unknown USB camera uh, <laughs> that I have on the model that um, has a weird lag issue, so we didn't put that it on does. painting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as how I'm doing the split screen, it's a free program called OBS. Uh, and there's a ton of uh, helpful videos and things like that online that get you up to speed on that. Um, the program itself is free. There's a plugin for the iPhone and the iPad uh, that something like $15, but you only need to buy it once, and then you can put it on all of your devices. Um, and it was a big help for, for this process. Yeah. And Michelle Ashby said she's uh, beyond excited to say that she's watching this demo through her TV, thanks to her tech-savvy half-paw. So. <laughs> Excellent. Hopefully the resolution's uh, yeah. coming through well on your television. Let's see, and Jerry Greenberg was wondering if you could repeat the color and temps that we just talked about. Sure. Well, as you can see, Jerry, in here, I'm putting in some warms, uh, something a little redder in the pink area, and that's right across the nose and cheeks. There tends to be a lot of, of blood right next to the surface there, and uh, that's always a warmer area. As you get up into the forehead, there isn't a lot of tissue, it's just skin right on top of bone. 
Um, there's not a lot of blood running through there, so things tend to be a little yellower, probably closer to what you would consider a traditional flesh color. And then as you move down into these lower planes around the mouth and jaw, they're turning away from you, so they're going to go cooler. Um, when I'm painting a woman, I'll usually go with something more towards a green. If I'm painting a man, I might go a little more towards a blue. But a blue can look a little bit like a five o'clock shadow, so <laughs> you really don't want to use that on a woman. building up some color in here right now. And this is where I lose a lot of the lines that I put in before. They serve their purpose, um, but um, I find if I draw too tightly in this phase when I'm blocking in the color because I've, I, I've grown attached to the line work, um, you lose a lot of the, the freedom in your brush stroke. You know, you get too attached to it. And Especially, sometimes it's not a good mark, but you know, you'll, you'll just hang on to it because you already did it. And this gives me the freedom to uh, pretty much start over. <laughs> Susie, Susie Kuhn out in uh, Rochester said she likes your initial colors. They're bold and exciting. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> blocking in these flesh tones before I go any farther with uh, detail on the face. I laid in the color here slightly darker in value on the neck than I did on the face because I want the face to come forward from the neck. I'm going to pull some of that back out with lighter colors, but I want to keep that uh, value pattern going. Lisa Rico out in California just uh, texted a shout out to Vanessa. She's an amazing mom. <laughs> she certainly is. And we've been working with B for quite a while. As I start to work into the nose and cheek area, and especially since we're getting some side light coming here from the right, flesh is slightly transparent, and the light actually enters the flesh and then bounces back out. So that means in these transition areas between the light and the dark, we tend to get higher chroma than you might 
otherwise suspect. And that's that subsurface scattering as the light enters the skin and then bounces back out. So I like to, when I start to work on this next re revision, um, getting closer to a finished version, I'll usually start right here at the bridge of the nose, where that becomes the forehead. It's a good point of reference for me to start comparing things against. I'm just using a little bit of charcoal to give myself a hard line for it. And that way I can conceptualize since really from this point below the eyes down through there is one flat plane with the wedge of the nose coming out from it. I'm able to think about it three-dimensionally and figure how that shape is coming out of the front plane. Susie Kuhn wants to know how your fingertips are holding up. <laughs> um, I haven't had fingerprints for about a decade, so... Um, color where I can. And we'll start actually bringing this together a little more. So since I have this line, this delineation on the left side of the nose, following this over, comparing the distance here in the red where it's starting to turn into this lighter color. I'm using that to measure optically where this shadow shape for the right eye ends on the left side. Hopefully that made some bit of sense. We have a lot of light coming into this shadow. I'm going to warm it up a bit especially in the eye socket. A lot of light gets bounced around in there. Hmm. 
Well, this is a question I don't think I've seen before from Peggy Post. She goes, she's not sure how to frame the question, but do you have any um, advice about ways of indicating the subject's age? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, first and foremost, it depends on whether it is a fine art piece or a commission piece, because that's really going to impact how you want to approach it. You know, if it's a fine art piece, go nuts, you know, um, you know, make them look as, as aged as you want and, you know, really work the textures. But if they're paying you, they're not going to want that. <laughs> so what I find is best to do, uh, let me grab a piece of charcoal to illustrate here. So often what people will do is um, say here in the eye, if Vanessa were of an age where she had crow's feet, you know, somebody come in with a dark pencil and put in those lines. And that instantly ages your model. Mm -hmm. What will be far more flattering is if instead of drawing the valleys, you draw the peaks. Instead of going dark, go light. Let me get the right color here. Just hit the peaks of those. It still indicates, I don't know if you can really see that on the screen, you know, it still indicates the maturity of your model mm -hmm. without making them look cronish. <laughs> Finding the shadow shape, coming in with a, a brown pencil. divot here in the cheek as it then comes over to meet the side of the nose. So I'm just again warming that up I'm trying to merge it into the darker shadow here in the eye so it becomes this single serpentine shape. some eyebrows because everybody needs those. I start to work into the skin that's on the light side of this right eye. These planes here are turning in, so I want to go a little bit cooler here. because of Vanessa's complexion. Going in with some grays. Uh, they work very well with uh, paler skin. Make sure I have this high point marked. Probably the lightest point on her head is right here at that corner of the temple. Start to map out some of these details with the eyelid.
And do let me know if I start to mumble. <laughs> I do it a lot. No, Jerry, I didn't fall, but thank you for asking. <laughs> So as I start to work into the detail of the eye itself, I want to make sure that the value of the white of the eye harmonizes with the flesh that's around it. You don't want to put in anything even close to absolute white. Um, really, ideally what I want is the exact same value as what's around the eye, but cooler. And not substantially cooler. Let's see if I have a pastel that meets those requirements. I'm sure we can find one in the studio somewhere. <laughs> so. You'd think, yeah. <laughs> The Amber Roos uh, asked a question. She goes, when I'm using a block of pastel or charcoal, it can be hard to tell where the point of the end is and where the mark lays on the paper. Does that just come with practice or do you have a, a technique for doing that? Um, it largely comes with practice and, you know, I'd be lying if I said it doesn't happen to me on a pretty regular basis. <laughs> um, it does help if you break your pastels. Um, if you noticed from when I showed you my set, almost all of them, uh, especially the Unisons and Sennelliers, I've snapped in half. And that gives me a very hard edge on one side. So that way I know if I need a hard line um, to just go to that side of the pastel. as opposed to those of us that use really pointed pastels. <laughs> I wish I could hire you to just sharpen all my pencils <laughs> for me. You could do surgery with those things. Yeah. Again, it's an acquired uh, technique. <laughs> I apologize, Amber. I am not good at names. <laughs> Coming in with charcoal and just refining some of this a little better. Especially since it's in the light. You know, this eye is in the light where this one is completely in shadow. This is by default the focus of the entire piece. For those who might just be joining us, our model today is Vanessa. And I don't want to get really tight in the rendering of this eye. I want some looseness to it. I want some of the colors to flow and break. It's not an anatomical drawing. So we don't need to know exactly where the tear ducts lie and all of those little details.
We have a question, why use vine charcoal over hard pastel or pencil when you're refining? Um, I like the way it flows on top of it. I get a nice soft stroke and it also works as a bit of a blender and will blend uh, the layers of color that I've already put down so I can get a bit of softness, which can sometimes be difficult to get in pastel without smudging everything around, which I really try to not do in the final <laughs> layers is, is to blend everything with, with my fingers. Um, there's something about pastel where its vibrancy comes from it sitting on top of the paper. And as soon as you start pushing it in and smearing it around, everything just looks muddy and dead. And Alice Hollander wants to know if you're using compressed charcoal. No, nope, this is um, Willow Charcoal. Uh, the brand is Coates. Uh, it's one of the softest ones I've come across. cooler here is the nose it starts to turn onto the other side of the face. You need to take a break, Pete? Okay, good. <laughs> Great. In the rush to get everything online, I forgot to set a timer for you. <laughs> I didn't know if we were in seven. <laughs> We've done about 45 minutes. Okay. Time to get moving then. I was going to say, sometimes when Vanessa models for us, it's the artists that need to break more than she does. <laughs> Peggy Post has another question. So given that you want to limit pushing the pastel into the paper, are you going to leave the places where the paper is showing through or just keep layering over? Generally, I keep layering over, uh, especially on UART, because it um, there's a little bit of a gloss to UART. If the light catches it in just a certain way, um, it'll lighten up substantially. and while sometimes that's great, usually it's not. Um, usually that's not what you want it to do. And it, it never occurs in the spots where you would find it useful. Um, so it's, you know, I, I just keep building it up. Keeping things as soft as I can here, squinting down and only painting what I see when I'm squinting. You know, I want to keep everything simplified. Thank you. 
building it all up. Been looking for places where I can bring some of this warm green that I used for the hair into the face so you know, everything can harmonize together. So I'm using it in here under the eyes, a transitional tone. And then as we get down into the, the mouth area. Annie H. from Concord, Mass. was wondering if there was a particular method or a book that you could recommend that would get someone started in drawing faces and heads. I know oh, there's a lot of them yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, there's the, the Loomis books. Um, there were a ton of those. Uh, some of them are specifically about uh, drawing the head. And, um, you know, a lot of those are also in the public domain now, so you can find uh, them for free online. Um, Bridgman uh, was another uh, artist who has been a, a huge influence on me as far as um, figuring out structure. And, you know, just look for those that move you and take inspiration from that. I've always been a huge fan of Rembrandt, so I steal from him regularly. <laughs> he doesn't seem to mind. Not anymore. Not anymore. Let's see, Laura Beckering was wondering if it was possible to zoom in on the eye area to show the softness that you're talking about. Sure, let me see what I can do with that. Maybe one minute here to complete the thought I was putting down. Mm -hmm. You can see, especially in the shadow area here, you know, everything's very soft. You know, the only hard edges are where the eyelid comes out over the, the eye itself, where I'm delineating those little folds. Everything else is kept very soft and delicate. So do you have any contemporary artists, Corey, that kind of inspire you to... If you're, if you're like me, you have too many. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, whew, um, let's see. A, a lot of my big inspirations these days come from uh, oil painters. Uh, Scott Connery mm -hmm. is a big one. Uh, Nick Alm is uh, just astounding. Um, 
in pastel. Um, for my money, it never got much better than the late Daniel Green. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So Norma Rollett is asking if your background paper uh, navy blue, or do you often use cool backgrounds to contrast and add emphasis to the warm tones in the portrait? Um, yes, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much of the background paper I'm going to let show through. Um, some of that is a design choice, some of that is simply going to be a time allowance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Of all the things I want to show you guys today, filling in the background isn't that high on the list. But um, I do like to leave some of the paper there. Um, I feel like it gives you a little bit of the, the feel of the hand of the artist coming through. And um, again, using that, that cool color of the paper with all of these warm tones really makes it pop out and come forward. And it gives you a great sense of depth. And just a little side message here. Anna and Xavier both say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Your artwork looks great. Both of my children are watching on YouTube. Uh, they were incredibly excited to hear that I was going to be on YouTube today. So, hi Anna, hi Xavier. <laughs> and Michelle Ashby asks, uh, who is the gorgeous little boy who was the model used for your extraordinary piece, Hodgepodge? That Where was... do you generally find your models? <laughs> well, that was Xavier. I generally find him at home. <laughs> um, as to where I find my models, I use my family a lot, um, especially <laughs> since March, mm -hmm. um, when you know getting models was very difficult. Um, aside from that, um, you know, people I meet around, uh, we have weekly life drawing sessions in the area, or at least did. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you'd get to know the models after a while and, you know, if you come up with an idea for something that works for that particular model, you set something up. Um, but I've always been a strong proponent of just working with what you have. You know, use your family, use yourself. You know, see if you can talk your neighbor into it. Um, use people that mean something to you. Mm -hmm. How are we on time, Dick? Uh, we're just a little before three, if you need okay. to take a stretch, V, or... Yeah. Fine. Good. Fine. Right. Awesome. That's why she's the best. Yep. Most professional one in the room. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see. Carolyn Hancock asks, uh, the light under the nose looks greenish. Is that how you usually paint the area above the lip? Um, it's a little greener than I want just yet, but I do want some of that green that I would mentioned earlier because these planes aren't coming forward quite as much and there isn't as much blood in that area of the face. You know, it's just a little bit of skin uh, that's going around the teeth there. But 
But as I go in and finally start refining that area more fully, it will be warmed up um, more into a yellow range. But I want that green down first, so when I apply the yellow, there'll be broken color on top and uh, you know, it'll mix optically. gotten to a point where I have a halfway decent head here. So really before I go into any detail, I just want to do another pass going through. Because especially when you squint down, it's so much easier to see large chunks of value as a shape rather than to look at you know the intricate structure of the lips. For example, you know, I'm just looking for where it goes from light to dark, trying to describe those shapes accurately. Laura Machnick says, hi, Corey. Do you generally have the vision in your mind before you start of the effect that you want to achieve? Hi, Laura. Um, <laughs> I try to. It, it doesn't always work out that way, especially in a, uh, a demo scenario, a lot of times you, you know, you're working with, with what's there. And I like to work with the model, not necessarily dictate everything to the model, because I am drawing this person, not, well, I'm attempting to draw this person, not necessarily my idea of this person. Um, you know, there, there's a back and forth on that. Christine Troyer uh, asks, uh, says, you are mostly self-taught. Did you have any formal training to advance your skills? I've taken several workshops over the years. Um, uh, Jeff Hine, Susan Lyon, um, David Gray, to, to name a few. And that's always very helpful. Yeah. But that said, unless you go back to the studio and start putting the things that you learn there into practice and actually think about what they taught you and try to incorporate that into your technique. Because a lot, of, especially as a teacher, I see a lot of people you know, will take a workshop with somebody, learn what they do, and then just out of habit, go back to painting the way they've always painted. Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy habit to break, but that's the only way you're really going to grow. hard edge on this shadow right here I want to capture because that's really going to throw this mastoid running through the neck into relief 
and since her head's turned, it's a little bit of anatomy that you want to have. wants to know how you decide on the background. Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Especially on something like this where I'm not really giving a lot of thought to the background. You know, it, it's, I, I'm just looking to render a decent likeness and some strong form. Um, so I want something that's going to complement that. So I would probably wait until this area in the cheek is a little more filled in because right now there's a lot of paper showing through. It's a little darker than I actually want it to be. But once I have that, I can look for what the value and temperature I want for the background is. You now, since this is predominantly warms and predominantly in the red and pink, I might go into a green but I have warm greens here, so I don't want something that's going to wash all of those out. Um, so I might go something a little bit cooler. Um, I might avoid it altogether. <laughs> it's been known to happen. Save it for the end. Exactly. <laughs> or better yet, save it for tomorrow. Yeah. This, uh, I mean, probably the biggest piece of advice I can give for painting portraits is wait till tomorrow to say it's done mm -hmm. because you need to be able to look at it with fresh eyes and you it's nearly impossible to do that while you're painting you know you need a little bit of distance from it and you know the, the painting that was absolutely brilliant the night before you wake up in the morning and you don't know what you were thinking and you're questioning your life choices <laughs> I was going to say, I've had just the opposite experience. I leave the studio thinking I've done another piece for the closet and uh, come in the next morning and realize well, that wasn't so bad. Okay. Yeah, if we combine forces on this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As we talked about earlier, now I'm starting to incorporate the muzzle area into what I have on the cheeks here. So I'm bringing in some warmer, um, you could call it a flesh tone, I suppose. It's the local color. But I, I'm still leaving a lot of those cooler greens in there, just little pops of them. So the whole area is more interesting. Here we have a plane change that's running right here along the side of the head. So we get into the temple, runs along her cheekbone here, and down the side of the face. So, since that's starting to recede away from us, I want to go a little bit cooler. I really <clears throat> don't want a value change here, I just want a temperature change. If I change the value and go darker to make the form turn, 
it's going to muddy this light shape that I have here. I just want to say that I'm enjoying this demo. Uh, usually I'm painting along with Corey. It's nice to just kind of sit and watch. Yeah, we just opened the studio space the beginning of last month. Yep. So we're still in the process of uh, getting everything set up and, well, honestly, occasionally being around other people. <laughs> looking since I have this center line going here it's not completely up and down it's more of a curve as it goes along the skull then I have this horizontal coming through like this I want to line up these eyes right along that now a lot of times people's eyes aren't exactly symmetrical typically that's something I want to fix in a portrait you know, if somebody has asymmetrical eyes, chances are pretty good if you draw it. Honestly, it's just going to look like you drew it wrong. So I take a little bit of a inspiration from uh, Da Vinci's sketches and the structures that he mapped out 500 years ago. Sandra Burchell uh, shared she loves the feeling of an impasto layering application, more reminiscent of thick paint. Thank you. Um, you know, I've, I'm also an oil painter, and a lot of my uh, historical favorites were those who, you know, uh, put the paint on very thickly. Uh, Rembrandt, Velasquez, uh, and then somewhat more recently, um, fashion. Um, so I'm trying to do that in pastel. Sometimes it works, sometimes not so much. <laughs> The light over here is daylight from the window over on this side. Just bringing in something a little bit cooler. Not quite blue, but a little bit of gray. And again, that gives a little bit more impact in the transition from these cools to the warms to the darks. come into the ear. I'm going a little bit warmer than I actually see. Um, it's more of a, a style thing than anything else, but um, I think, I feel like especially since I have these side planes here that have gone a little bit cooler, if I go warmer on the ear here, it takes that ear and instead of having it go back like everything else is, 
it makes it come out a little more because the ears don't follow back. They pop out from the side of your head a bit. Terry Lynn is asking if the video will be available after the live demo, and I think it will be on your YouTube. Yep, it will be on my YouTube indefinitely, and um, I believe we'll be sharing a copy with PSA as well, uh, so they can disseminate as they see fit. If you go to uh, Corey Pitkin's uh, YouTube channel, he has uh, several videos up there that are really worth the watch. I say that because I've watched them all. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know somebody's watching them. Yeah. charcoal pencil just to move some things around a little bit. Get a finer edge, a couple areas. Uh, see, Pam Walker, uh, please explain the darker value muddying the light shape if you turn the form. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so if... On the side of the face, mm -hmm. she's saying, yeah. If you squint down to where you're just seeing two values, there's the shadow shape coming down here, plus a little extra here. And then there's the light shape. Now, if I were to take some of this value and move it over here to move the form, it's going to break off this whole area. And I really don't want you know, a bunch of little islands of light and dark. I want a big shadow shape. I want a big light shape to the best of what's possible with this uh, pose, which is part of the reason why when I was coming into these shadows here in the eye, I brought in more of these oranges and lightened it up a bit. start to put in the nostril. I'm doing this in charcoal, um, really just because that's what was in my hand. Because I don't want a big, dark spot right here. You, know, you can already see it's kind of broken up the area that I had there. So it's just using the charcoal to map out where I'm going to place it. And what I'm going to do is come in with a, a red and cover that up. Because light's coming through the side of the nose here and illuminating that flesh ever so slightly.
see Eden Compton sent us a nice compliment. Uh, beautiful color here, Corey. Congrats on the new studio. It looks fabulous. Thanks, Eden. <laughs> I have to make it over to your spot soon. Yeah. Uh, you have the, the new space across the street now. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things we haven't been able to do as of late, so <laughs> yeah. But we'll make it over eventually. Let's see, Jerry Greenberg asked, do you ever use hard pastels or do you go directly to the soft? I usually go directly to the soft. Um, if I do use hard pastels, it's more to modify edges. You know, I might use one to glaze over between um, passages so I get a smoother transition between the two. But um, I like to start out with the color as saturated as I wanted it, instead of so, uh, working my way up to it. Mm -hmm. Fill in some of the tooth here so I can accurately judge everything. It's all going to be covered up by a second pass anyway. So. About 40 minutes left. Okay, great. Oh, I think if we run over, I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to kick me out. <laughs> but I think we're pretty much on track for yeah. that. Softening the edges here in the hairline, because you want the hair to flow into the head, not sit on top of it like a wig. I can sneak some color into the hair as well. Bring some of these oranges into the transition area between the light and shadow. And also right along the hairline because the hair isn't completely opaque. Light's going to travel through the individual strands and hit some of the skin that's underneath the hair. That's going to give it a little more color. Trying to keep all of these strokes flowing in the direction of the strands of hair. And that way I don't have to necessarily draw each individual strand. It's, it's more implied. Uh, Chris asks, if you were painting this in oils, would colors and planes be the same? Generally, yes. Um, I mean, the, the planes are, are largely set by the anatomy. Um, the colors, well, 
as with anything that's you know artistic, um, you're only as beholden to reality as you want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you could you could do this entire portrait in shades of green as long as the pattern between your darks and your lights were correct, it would read like a face. But uh, in general, I do tend to go for a more neutral palette, and then I'll find ways to bring in little pops of color just to, as interest um, as I go through it. I feel like I'm starting to get a real Russian Impressionist vibe off of this piece. Mm -hmm. And I love the Russian Impressionist, so I'm happy with that. that long black stick you just used was that charcoal. That was, yep. Yep, that is the Coates well charcoal. We hold not fast. Yeah, I don't, uh, Bonnie uh, Wilkenfield, or w Wilkenfeld, I'm sorry. This is awesome. You're doing a spectacular job. It would be great if you were able to zoom in on the model so the audience could see what features you are referring to. But I think we're limited um, as far as getting much closer. Yeah, unfortunately, that's as close as the cord goes. <laughs> For future demos. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. so, yeah. Definitely. And that is one of the plans for the studio here, too, is to uh, gradually do more and more uh, live, either live demos or, or videos. As well as teaching. As well as teaching. And, yes. you know, once, once we're at a point where we can host in person workshops again, yep. we'll definitely be doing them from here. Until that point, yeah. 
I hope to have some coming from Zoom in the next month or so. Yeah, we do have a, a couple of spaces in the building here that would be uh, absolutely perfect for workshops. Mm -hmm. Although they may make us do uh, like IAPS does and uh, put a layer of plastic down on the floor. <laughs> It's not a bad idea, yeah. especially if we want our security deposit back. <laughs> See, Elaine Denton asks if you are intentionally painting with a light border around the painting, or is that just the tape? That's just the tape. I've tried to use, um, there is a, a black painter's tape that somebody makes um, that does look nicer, but it doesn't hold as well. And this being you are, there's a curl to this paper <laughs> and you need some strong tape to keep it down or it's going to try to run away on you. So working on the earrings here, I want to keep this really as simple and abstract as I possibly can. Really just a couple marks. And then find the high point where I'm getting the most gloss and hit that. I'll answer this question. Uh, Laura Beckering uh, said, sorry, I missed this info, but where is here and where are you filming from? Thank you. Uh, Laura, we're filming from Hudson Falls, New York, which is uh, up in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. And this is a new studio that uh, Corey and I, along with Matt Kessner, are sharing. We opened uh, just a few weeks ago, so we're still trying to get uh, up and running here. But uh, we're about an hour north of Albany, New York, if you know where that is. want to scratch my nose and my <laughs> fingers absolutely covered in pesto. Yeah. Try not to do that on camera at least. <laughs> well, that was like a gentleman that used to figure draw with us, Stu Eichel. Um, always had charcoal on his chin and his nose. <laughs> I'm looking for some areas here in the neck, <clears throat> in the neck where I can bring in a bit more color. You know, everything seems a little flat right here, especially compared with the vibrancy I have above it. So I want to tie that together a little bit. I'm seeing some greens here under the chin and here.
They're subtle, but let's see if I can bring them in. But keep the value, or maintain the value pattern that I have. from Sandra Burchell. Do you mount your larger works before you start? And if so, how? If I were smarter. <laughs> um, I have been trying to, uh, because mounting afterwards is a white knuckle process, especially if you have a piece that you know, you know is good and you don't want to destroy. Um, I've been using the 3M repositionable mounting tape as of late, and uh, that is really my best friend right now. Um, it's absolutely worth the money. You also do some work on a aluminum composite mm -hmm. panel too, right? That yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been using that for oil painting for years. Um, and um, I've been mounting pastels to it for a while now as well because it's, well, this is actually a piece of uh, aluminum, so I'll show you a little bit. Yeah, it's, this is three millimeters thick, so it's an ideal surface to mount on. Um, it'll work in any frame. It won't bend or buckle uh, with humidity like uh, a lot of paper-based boards will. And um, the price is right. Um, I get a four foot by eight foot sheet for $65. So, um, you know, can't beat that. <laughs> Somebody just shared, it's good to know about the 3M tape. I have the same problem and don't always mount before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, uh, for years, I used a uh, spray adhesive put out by uh, Elmer's. And um, I have had some real disasters. <laughs> um, I had a piece that came back just this year from Florida. And uh, the humidity and that adhesive did not mix well. Um, and I haven't had the courage to deframe that piece and see what I can actually do with it. And somebody asked if you could please say the name of the board again. Aluminum composite material. Um, in the industry, it's typically called ACM. Um, and uh, it's, it's what um, road signs are printed on. So, you know, it, it will stand up to, mm -hmm. uh, to a lot of abuse. Um, you can usually get it through either a plastic supplier, a lot of sign makers will have it, um, you know, especially those that do digital printing. Uh, they print on this a lot these days. I think uh, Die Bond is the, the commercial name for it, uh, you know, the, the brand name. To answer your question, Laura, uh, Corey does uh, oil paintings on the aluminum as well. Yep. For that, uh, what I'll have to do is I'll scuff up the aluminum, the primer that you saw on the other side, mm -hmm. with some sandpaper. Then I'll come at it with uh, an acrylic gesso, a couple layers of that, and then I might put an oil primer on top of that. Um, it is an involved process and it takes a while, but it makes a really nice surface to paint on.
Hmm? How ran time? Uh, it's about 25 to 4. Okay. We're doing good. Personally, I think we should hire to go another hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's always that way with our sketch group. When we used to meet in person, you'd get to 15 minutes left and let them know. And about half of the group would go, no! And then the other half would start packing. <laughs> uh, Lisa Rico says you are buying the large 4x8 sheet. How do you cut the ACM? I use a table saw. Um, but you don't need a table saw to cut it. Um, you can just use a, you know, a box cutter and score it a couple times and it'll snap along that score. Mm -hmm. um, I've had to do that before when pieces uh, that were already mounted weren't quite fitting into a frame. Yeah. And another compliment for Vanessa from uh, Carolyn Hancock, a remarkable model to not take breaks and hold the pose. Only the best for the Pastel Society of America. <laughs> and that's also one of the reasons most of us have an awful lot of drawings of Vanessa. <laughs> oh yeah. We could do an entire show just We could. <laughs> Answer. Uh, Michelle Ashby asks, so sorry I missed the start, so I don't know who is with Corey in the studio. Uh, my name is Dave Francis. I am a uh, master pastelist with PSA and uh, also an IAPS master circle artist. Um, Corey and I have been friends for quite a long time. At least so, 10 years. Yeah. If, no, it's got to be more than that because my kids yeah, are almost it's 10. more than that. Yeah. Well, it goes back, I think, to the first Pastel National they did up in Old Forge, so. Wow. Yeah. And we also have a young up-and-coming artist that we're uh, nudging along, Matt Kessner. So. Yep, you'll all be seeing a lot from Matt in the next yes, few years. Yes, definitely. Uh, Carolyn Hancock asks, the, the shadow side and eye stay masked in with no detail, even if you have to finish off camera? Um, yeah, largely. Um, I mean, there's enough information there for you to know that that's an eye. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to, you know, refine this tomorrow, I might uh, clean up some of the shapes, but... Um, I really don't want 
a lot of information there. I want all of my information here in the lights. You know, um, and it's kind of mimicking the way the eye sees. You know, the, when you're looking in the lights, your pupil constricts, and then you see all the detail in the lights. Once you switch to the darks, your pupil dilates, and then you see the detail in the darks. But you can't see both at the same time. So I'm trying to guide the viewer <laughs> and tell them, I want you to look at the lights. Yeah. Thank you for that nice compliment, Pam. I really enjoy what I do. I have a stray hair going across Vanessa's face here that I will try and capture. I might regret it. <laughs> it's happened before, getting into new details this late in the game. But hey, it's not like we're streaming this live mm -hmm. out over the internet. Yeah. You know, who's going to see? Yeah, exactly. Tend to go a little more. I tend to go a little quiet in this final phase. Um, I find it's a little tougher to articulate my thoughts at the same time as I'm doing them. Um, so I'm prioritizing, you know, the mark making and, and the piece over um, putting words together. <laughs> <laughs> that was phrased eloquently. <laughs> Dylan says, is it just me or does it go slightly out of focus once in a while? Um, it's possible that it does. Um, we have the focus locked on the devices, but it could also be a bandwidth issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annie. Okay. 
I'm just looking for finishing touches I want to put in. I haven't really addressed any of the light that's hitting the hair here. So I want to get that. Maybe a little bit more here in the temple. But I'm approaching that that area of a painting where more isn't going to help it. You know, I'm largely happy with the way it's turned out. There have been too many pieces over the years that I've just noodled with <laughs> after I was happy with them. And then I'm not happy with them anymore. just as a pop of color, although not that yellow. Moises Menendez says, great work, Corey, and thank you so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you from Mickey Dillon. I am really enjoying this demo. Enjoy the, his colors and layering. Thank you for doing this for us today. My pleasure. Really, anytime PSA wants me to do a demo for them, I'd be happy to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gwyneth Barth White um, comments, gorgeous work at the end. Could we see your color box again? I'll be happy to, so, yes. I'll make a note of that so he doesn't forget. Yes, that. yes, please remind me. <laughs> And uh, when this is all done, probably tomorrow, um, you know, I'll break out a good camera, get a good final image of this, and uh, I'll be sharing that on social media. And uh, maybe I'll find a way to uh, splice it into the, the final cut of the recording as well. Corey from New Zealand. It's Julie Freeman. Uh, really enjoyed the demo and especially hearing your thought process. Thank you. Oh, thank you for tuning in, Julie. Yeah, we're, we're both huge fan of you and, and your husband's work. So. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn DeGriel, thank you so much, Corey. What a great way to spend an afternoon. A flute of Prosecco and watching you paint. That does sound like a great way to spend an afternoon. At least the first part. I don't know, should I mention uh, what we're having later? <laughs> well, drinks will be had here as well. <laughs> Yes, we tend to be bourbon drinkers here, so that's where we're headed at the end of this. Michelle Ashby, thank you, Corey, for being the best program on TV in a very long time. <laughs> thank you, David. Lovely to hear from you, and wow, what a phenomenal model. Well, thank you so much.
just softening up edges, looking for places that are a little too, a little too graphic, a little too, a little too, I don't, I don't. <laughs> Sometimes putting these things to words doesn't quite work. <laughs> I've got a thanks, Corey, Cindy Gillette here with my Moscow mule. Enjoyed <laughs> every moment. Excellent. Good to hear, Cindy. Yeah. And from Jerry Greenberg. Thank you, Corey, for sharing your gift and your knowledge. Another masterpiece. And thank you, Dave, for all you do as well. Wonderful model as has been mentioned. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. What time do we have? Um, about eight minutes to four o'clock. Okay. I don't see playing with this making it much better. So <laughs> let me get a little bit of pastel off my hands and uh, we'll go back to uh, the video feed of the, the pastel box. And uh, I'll keep it up if anybody has any questions uh, about brands or organization or anything like that. Thank you, Susie. It's good to hear from you, too. Hope to get out to Rochester again soon. Yes. Yes, it has been too long, Susie. All right. So that is the box. See, I'm all caught up on cord here. Let me see if I can get closer for everybody. Go. This is the uh, Richardson Ross box. Um, folds up and uh, travels very well. Um, you know, I've taken this on, on multiple planes and everything arrives still intact. Um, and it's really fun to bring it in your carry on because it really confuses TSA. <laughs> um, so I have. My reds, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, warm neutrals, cool neutrals, and just some miscellaneous because I had you know two extra bays. Um, this far bay here, you can see there's um, golden colors, browns, and then grays. Uh, since I do a lot of portrait work and sketches, um, those are uh, for jewelry. You know, uh, gold jewelry, silver jewelry, um, along with you know some of the the ancillary colors up here. Um, I don't go very light on the lights. Um, you know, I have probably this. I don't even think is an absolute white, but it's definitely the closest to it. Um, most of my lights here probably start in a range of, you know, if one being white and ten being black. A lot of my lights start at about a three, and then I go as deep and dark as I possibly can. Lisa, Lisa Rico, uh, so much fun. Lo loved watching and listening. It was also fun to hear from and know many of my art friends were watching too. It felt like we were all together. Let's do this every Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a perfect idea, Lisa. <laughs> um, so if we don't have any questions about the box, that's, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. well, we do have to say some thank yous. Yes, yes. Uh, here's the final image. Uh, like I mentioned, I will post on social media probably tomorrow. Um, so I'd like to thank the Pastel Society of America uh, Jimmy Wright and uh, Susan Story, who I've worked with a lot on getting this out to everybody over the past uh, couple months. And um, thank you all for tuning in. It's been a great time.
and uh, hopefully I can see you all in person sometime in the not too distant very future. soon. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you.